27 years ago, at the very first hackers conference in 1984, the conference organizer and tech visionary Stuart Brand was arguing about some of the finer points of intellectual property with Steve Wozniak, co-founder of the Apple Computer Company. Voz claimed that some companies are hiding information. And that's when Stuart Brand said, information wants to be free. That was a historic, pivotal moment for generations of hackers and digital activists who have since then used that phrase as a battle cry, a cause to rally behind as they liberate information and work to make it accessible to everyone. In today's reality, data has become the new oil, and information is the new currency of power in the 21st century. Because information represents refined, processed, and analyzed data, and we generate trillions of megabytes each day. In fact, 90% of the world's data has been produced in just the last few years. If you took all of the information in the famous Library of Alexandria in Egypt, you took all of those papyrus scrolls and that ancient knowledge, and you, you put it together in one place, Digitally, it would all fit into a single thumb drive. In the 21st century, digital information is being created, analyzed, and stored at an astonishing rate, much greater than our predecessors. So what does information want? And what does it mean for us? I believe hackers hold the answer. For as long as I can remember, I've always been fascinated with information. I was driven by curiosity from a very early age, reading volumes of the encyclopedia instead of a bedtime story. And when we first got access to the internet in my hometown of Tel Aviv, Israel, I realized that my simple computer could be the portal to an entire universe of information. So I taught myself how it worked. I learned how to code and how to find answers to my many questions. Sometimes those answers would be on other people's computers. I didn't know it at the time, but everything I was doing, my activities, were actually hacking. I only realized it when I met my first hacker mentor. Her name, Angelina Jolie. She portrayed the fierce high school hacker called Acid Burn in a Hollywood movie that came out in 1995. As a nerdy and impressionable 13-year-old geek girl, I was hooked instantly. Because for the first time, I saw kids with the same passion as I had, using their power over information as a tool to shape the world. Kids who could use their intellect as a superpower. So I chose to become a hacker, just like my Hollywood heroes. Spoiler alert if you haven't seen the movie, in the film, the hackers were not the bad guys. In fact, they were the ones who uncover information that exposes corporate corruption. They're the ones who prevent an ecological catastrophe, stopping a dangerous virus that threatens to capsize an oil tanker. Perhaps not a realistic scenario in 1995, but a very realistic scenario today. That's the type of hacker I wish to become, a hacker hero and I've spent more than 25 years in the hacker's world. What I've learned is that it's not just about information. It's about access. It's about who gets to know what and when. Who gets to create, to change, to manipulate the flow of information. That's the real power behind the scenes. And hackers, we know this very well. And I'm not just talking about friendly hackers, ethical hackers, and security researchers like me who work to expose software vulnerabilities and make the information about them known to everyone. I'm also talking about malicious criminals and cyber spies. In fact, today's cyber criminals have learned to use our information against us. Take ransomware, for example. This is a type of attack we've all heard about where a virus encrypts your files and then requests ransom in exchange for the decryption key. If you think about it, it's almost the perfect crime. 
The criminals take away your access to your own information, and then they sell it back to you. One such virus is called Ryuk, and it's a very scary virus indeed. In fact, it's named after a character from a Japanese animation series called Death Note. And not just any character, the god of death. And in Ryuk's own Death Note, the ransom note left on computers it encrypts, Ryuk says, no system is safe. Indeed, it's already impacted human lives. In the US, Ryuk has infected a network of 400 hospitals and doctors' practices. And it's also targeted universities, proving no one is immune to its attacks. In France, Ryuk was probably the virus behind the October 2020 attack on Soprasteria, a multi-billion euro technology company that manages, amongst other things, French border control technology. Threats like Ryuk's are sophisticated and they always evolve. And in fact, the cyber criminal groups behind them make money, but they reinvest it in R&D, research and development, innovating and creating new capabilities. In fact, it's estimated that Ryak has made more than $150 million in payments in ransom. And we know this because we can track the cryptocurrency transactions in the blockchain. They are transparent to us, although the criminals are not. In recent months, the French security agency, ANSI, has released a report about Ryuk adding additional capabilities, including a worm-like capability that will allow it to spread inside an organization from computer to computer, infecting more and more systems, just like a real-world virus. What's more is that in the last year, criminals have learned to use our information not just as a hostage, but also as leverage and incentive. So now ransomware attacks come with a warning. Pay us or else we will leak your information to everyone, exposing your secrets to the public, taking your access and giving it away. These modern criminals also issue press releases. They set up websites to feature and publicize their leaks. They even have branding and press relations and logos. In fact, this is a tactic pioneered by a criminal group and ransomware brand called Maze, which was one of the first to feature files leaked from their targets. In one case, files from major consumer electronic companies that were hit by the ransomware and extortion attack combination. And ultimately, their information was exposed. In another case of a ransomware attack, we got a rare glimpse into the payment negotiations between the victim and the criminals. As the victims rush to contact the attackers within a 48 hours ultimatum, they're asking for a special price instead of $10 million, the requested ransom. And the criminals are very quick to respond in their support chat. And they explain that $10 million would actually be a normal price for a company of that size, with a not very subtle reminder that if their information is leaked, the lawsuits, the reputational loss, and the damages would be greater than that ransom payment. Ultimately, that victim decided to pay. According to Reuters, the company CWT, Carlson Wagonet Travel, a major travel technology company, paid about $4.5 million in Bitcoin. And I think that there are many other such stories hiding in the shadows. So to me, what these attacks prove is that most organizations and individuals are not prepared for an age of radical transparency where all information is free. In fact, think about your own personal digital data republic at home and in the office. Your files, your devices, your photos, your online services, your chats and SMS messages with a hand on your heart. Are you prepared to share everything with everyone? Few people are. And to make things worse, we now have more data breaches than ever before, which force us to deal with this reality. 
So if data is the new oil, perhaps data breaches are like oil spills, catastrophic events that create damage across the ecosystem, ruin people's reputations and lives. Yet very seldom are those responsible held accountable. And I'm not just talking about the criminals and the hackers. I'm also talking about the companies who collect all that data. Initiatives like the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation in Europe, try to put a price on data breaches and sanction companies that overstep and mishandle our data. Ultimately, what these regulations try to say is, if you can't afford to protect the information, don't collect it. But today's data-hungry corporates can seldom resist that temptation. After all, everybody tells them that data is the most valuable thing. Who benefits? Who loses? All human beings have three lives, public, private, and secret. According to the poet and author Gabriel Garcia Marquez, our secret lives matter, and we're not ready to give them up just yet. Have you asked yourself recently, what is the value of a secret in the information age? How much would you be willing to pay to keep your information secret? Maybe a question you'll have to consider in the next few years. We should all take the time to reconsider our notions and expectations of privacy and secrecy, and corporate transparency and secrecy. Because big data is now fueling the next wave of innovation, and we are the engine. So I'd like to ask you, is privacy a privilege or a right? Perhaps it should be seen more as an endangered species. And if we want it to survive, we must protect it, but also help it evolve. As any hacker will tell you, yes, you can dance like no one is watching, but encrypt like everyone is. That's our new reality. I don't have all the answers about our future, but what I can tell you is, as we connect more and more elements of our lives and make them smarter, we're fueling data collection and information gathering in a larger scale, grander than anything the human species has ever experienced. In each minute of each day in the past year, we generated millions and millions of data points, contributing to big technology companies' accounts at the end of the day. Data never sleeps, and it keeps growing. Of course, data is not the same as information. One way to look at it is that data is the diamond in the rough. It still requires mining, refining, processing, and analysis to become valuable. And that's why companies are now worth billions, because they turn that data into valuable information. But that said, information should also not be seen as a scarce natural resource or a mineral. In fact, what's unique about data and information is that it makes more of itself. It multiplies. As you analyze it, you gain even more insights and data. In the same time, our digital ecosystem is set to explode exponentially. In 2025, planet Earth will be home to 10 times more digital devices than human beings. And if that's not enough, 463 exabytes of data will be generated each day by humans in the year 2025. One exabyte is about a million terabytes, just to put things in perspective. That's why some hackers will tell you that digital information can be seen as the new dominant life form on our planet, one that replicates in order to survive, just like a virus. So what does information want? Well, the famous marketing guru Seth Godin recently said that what information seeks is the network effect. It doesn't just want to replicate. It wants to be shared widely because that increases its value. Think about the Latin alphabet, the ABC. The more people know it and use it, the more useful and valuable it becomes. Think about a music video or a TikTok film or a speech. It becomes more valuable, more impactful when it goes viral. Its value increases the more it is shared. Which brings me back to the point we started with back in 1984. 
Remember Stuart Brand and Steve Wozniak arguing at the hackers conference? It turns out there's a digital record of that event, a video. And what Stuart Brand actually said was more nuanced, more complex. He said, on the one hand, information wants to be expensive because it's so valuable. The right information in the right place just changes your life. But on the other hand, information wants to be free because the cost of getting it out is getting lower and lower all the time. So you have these two fighting against each other. To this prediction, Steve Wozniak said, clever and quick as always, information should be free, but your time should not. Woz was making the point about the true constraint in the information age, the scarcity of human attention and intellect. He should know. He was one of the first hackers in history. So to me, the real question for us to consider is what we want from information. And I believe human beings want to be free. So it's not information that wants to be free. It's us. Our future may be defined by our efforts to balance technology's benefits and innovations against the risks that it brings with it. But it should also be defined by how we evolve our concepts of privacy and access to information. This is something hackers have been talking about for decades, reminding us, showing us the truth behind the scenes. Hackers scare us because they shatter our illusions of privacy and control over information. But in some cases, they force governments and corporates to be as transparent to us as we are to them. Like the famous Oxford researcher Dr. Rachel Boatsman once said, trust and transparency are not the same thing. In fact, they are somewhat opposite. We demand transparency from those we do not trust. And in many cases, we have no choice but to trust technology, although it's far from transparent for most of us. But not to hackers. Hackers can see the operating system of the world. And that gives me hope, because this is the lesson that hackers teach us. If we want to control our future, we should begin by controlling our information. Thank you very much. Hack the planet, USI. Back on stage here live with Kirin Lazari. So it's the strange experience to watch yourself your own talk, Kiran, while you were waiting. Do you still agree with what you have heard? <laughs> Anything I agree, to change? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, what I'm taking away from my own talk is that ownership of information is really a concept that has to evolve in the 21st century. We think we own our data, but we don't. And I, I would like the talk to be a call to action to everybody listening to try and take ownership and responsibility of our digital data republics, because this is what's powering the next step of innovation for so many huge companies that are making billions and billions of dollars and euros. We should have some responsibility over that as well. Okay, got a question here from the audience. So I'm starting with the, the first one that I see without any curation. You talk about hackers uh, becoming more and more bold and branded uh, and also more and more transparent, uh, even having a chat support. Do we ever see hackers being held legally responsible for their hacks? This is the first question. That's a great question. So I have to say, if I'm honest, in the past few months, law enforcement organizations, including in France, in Europe and in the United States, have been doing more and more. And they're really trying to stop down, especially with the new epidemic of ransomware. The reason we're seeing so many ransomware cases is because in the past two years, it's just become an incredibly successful business model. And for a variety of reasons, 
some political, some economical, some more complex and technical, it was really difficult to stop a lot of these groups. In the past few months, there is a change. And I can see that the FBI in the United States has set up an anti-ransomware task force. And together with collaborations like Europol and law enforcement agencies around the world, and with the work of many friendly hackers, they are starting to arrest in some cases, the ransomware operators, the masterminds, and the developers of ransomware software. In fact, if I can mention something that was quite unique, the other day I read that there was an arrest of a 52-year-old woman who was uh, arrested as one of the developers of cybercrime software. So most people think of hackers as men, friendly hackers as well, but you should know that there are hackers of all genders out there. Okay, thank you. Got a question also uh, from uh, Laurent who says, a governmental organization often use a trigger uh, to know if it's interesting to follow such and such a people, the fact that the information uh, exchange is encrypted. Do you really think that the encrypting, uh, encrypting the information is the key? If you hide or encrypt information, it means that you have something to hide, so it turns yourself into a target to a criminal public organization. How to deal with en encrypt uh, this, the, the, the fact that we encrypt Encrypt information because you are, uh, people are looking at you uh, since you are encrypting things. That's a great question. So there is a trick here. If more and more and more of us start using encryption on a daily basis, using encrypted applications like Signal, for example, or using encryption in our communications, it will be more normal. And so we would be not hiding anything. We would just be doing the normal thing. So the more it becomes more widely adopted, the more normalized it is more people can actually take responsibility and protect the transfer of their own data and, and information. And I want to add one more thing to that. I'm not claiming that we should encrypt and hide everything that we do online and everything that we have on our devices. But I do think it's time to consider what we really want to keep secret, what we really want to keep private, and to understand that not everything that we do online is secret or private. And if we want it to be private and secret, we have to engage a little bit. We have to put some energy into that. Okay, this is clear. Uh, Kiran, how do you see the future with all these malevolent hacking organizations? Will we be capable of stopping all this one day? Uh, will it stop one day or it will never stop? Wow, so this is a question for the prophets and maybe the astrologists out there. What I can tell you is that I've been in the cybersecurity industry for more than half my life, for more than 25 years, and it's always evolving. So every time we come up with a solution, we come up with a new strategy, there's a new type of attack or a new innovation. Hackers are incredible innovators. I don't think that's going to stop. I think that even as we adopt new technologies, there will be new ways to exploit them and take advantage of them. I do hope that we learn from hackers so that we can be more prepared for this future. And I think we need all the friendly hackers that we can get, which is why I'm a big supporter of friendly hacker communities and organizations in Israel and around the world. If you have an interest in this field yourself, Christian, or your audience, if you want to become a cybersecurity professional, this is not a job that's going to go away. It's a job that's going to stay. Oh, it's a kind of never ending story, so. Um, now the question, uh, beyond uh, owning your data, what is the future of the concept of ownership of information, which by nature can be copied, uh, shared, and also rediscovered and remade as such? What is the future of concept as ambivalent, as intellectual property from your point of view, Karen? Wow, what a fantastic question. So I would answer that maybe the new boundary is not necessarily the intellectual property that we create, but rather our own identity and keeping our own identity because identity is going to become the key for everything that you will be able to access for managing your information, for sharing information, for posting things online and having those messages verified as coming from you. So this is why I use a gadget like, like these, for example. These are access authentication tokens that I use to log into some of my more secret or more confidential accounts. And I think in the future, we are all going to have to put a lot more effort into protecting our digital identity identity 
it's not going to be just about passwords. Passwords belong in our past. They are no longer relevant for the 21st century. So this is the next step. The evolution of intellectual property is actually the protection of the self, the identity, our digital identity. Do you think in the near future, everyone uh, will have the keys that you presented? Uh, is, it, is it already the case in some countries? Uh... I hope so. So these are, one of these I got from Google. This one is from Google and you can see it's a little gadget. It's actually connecting with my computer wirelessly. This one I received from Facebook and it connects to my computer via USB. But there are a lot of other technologies out there. And at the moment about About 10% of users, for example, on Google use things like multi-factor authentication or two-step verification, which are some of the complicated sounding names for these basic technologies that allow us to have much more secure access. In the future, I think more people will use devices like this. Maybe they'll use the biometric readers on their phones, like a face, face ID or thumbprint ID. Our future is definitely going to be reliant on more of these identification technologies, whether it's biometrics or other tools. And I encourage everybody to start using these. Uh, this works for uh, adults uh, like you and I, but we know that children are going around the, the internet and the web. Uh, how can you say a 10 years old child uh, uh, that is going on the internet uh, to share or do not share data on social networks? Uh, I don't know if you're yourself a mother, but uh, concerning the, the, the youth generation and the, chil and the children, uh, what kind of policy do we have to implement? Uh, do, do they still have, uh, uh, can it be possible that they have keys like the, those you, you, you are presenting? Great question. I think I was very lucky to grow up on the internet when the internet was itself quite young. So I grew up together with the internet. And when I was a 10 or 12 year old girl on the internet, chatting to people on the other side of the world, they had no idea that they were talking to a, a young girl from Tel Aviv. I instinctively somehow learned to mask my identity, to create an alter ego online. Nobody told me I should do that. I just learned it myself through hacker chat rooms. So perhaps we need to give our children some basic digital skills on how to protect their identity and how to protect their internet activities. Whether they can use things like this, maybe, but there are other technologies out there that perhaps are more intuitive. And I think definitely with the smartphones that a lot of kids have these days, we can use those smartphones to verify their identity as well. How can we protect children as they browse the internet? It's a really big question. What I can tell you is I'm very grateful that my parents and I think my school teachers gave me a pretty clear moral compass even if they didn't know what was really happening on the internet because it was as new to them as it was new to me, they gave me some core beliefs and ideologies for myself that I followed. And I hope that's what has kept me safe so far. Okay. Back on, on encryption, because I have a question related to it. What are your views on the quantum computers being able to decrypt RSA encryption? How will that affect our privacy and lives? That's a, a really, really pertinent question because there are indeed some very big companies and countries that are developing supercomputing and quantum computing capabilities, which is why encryption specialists and cryptography specialists are now developing something which is called post quantum encryption, utilizing new types of encryption algorithms and technologies that would be immune to the attacks even of these types of new quantum computing devices. For most of us, I think it's going to be some time, a couple of years, before we begin to interact ourselves with quantum computers or with post-quantum technologies. But rest assured, I know for a fact that the leading institutions in the world that are focusing on this, including the Of course, the government agencies, but also the academic institutions are working on this and developing the next stage of technology to encrypt that would be immune to these types of computers. So it's the same, same thing with security. It's not a journey that you reach it and you're on the end and you've reached the destination. We are secure or we are encrypted. Rather, it's an ongoing journey where you have to evolve all the time, which is why I find this area so fascinating. The problems that we work on today are different from the ones we worked on 20 years ago. And it's so dynamic and interesting. It's an area that can keep you on your toes no matter how young or how old you are. It's always evolving. And that's how we need to see it. Thank you. <laughs> um, 
question here. Uh, is the best protection against ransomware, because you talk about ransomware, is uh, to have nothing to hide. It is even possible. Uh, this is a question that uh, is quite surprising, because having nothing to hide, I don't know a person or an organization that has nothing to hide, but maybe you can, uh, you can answer differently. How do you answer this question concerning you have nothing to hide? Is that the best way to... Yes, go. So I agree with you. I don't think that there's anyone that has nothing to hide. It's a very personal human thing, just like the poet Gabriel Garcia Marquez said. Everybody has some, some aspect to their lives, which is private and secret. But more than that, the basis of ransomware is not just about exposing your secrets to everyone. It's about taking away your access to your data. So even if you don't have anything to hide, we all rely on digital technology. And that's what ransomware does. It really hits us in the soft belly because it takes away our access to digital technology. So the best solution or the best prevention against ransomware, first and foremost, I think it's in strategy, in realizing where are my digital assets, what are my technologies that I rely on, where is all my information, and how am I prepared for when something takes it away? Do I have a backup? What happens if my information is leaked? Am I prepared to respond? Am I prepared to take responsibility for my information that's leaked? It really is a mindset solution, not a, a preventative solution. On the more technical front, to prevent ransomware from infecting you, there's a few things that you can do. And the first thing here, again, is in the mindset, is have more common sense. Don't click on any link. Don't download any application. Don't uh, share your password. Don't recycle your password. Because these are the three main ways that ransomware gets into an organization. Either a phishing email or uh, maybe a recycled password that's been leaked and the attacker gets in using that password. Or they trick somebody into running an application inside the network. These are the three major ways that you can stop ransomware by being more vigilant. So building your own immune system against these types of attacks. You're certainly aware of the fact that we have in Europe something called GDPR. Uh, it's not really related to security, but more privacy. Uh, but uh, how do you see uh, this uh, kind of answer to uh, data privacy, uh, the general data privacy here in Europe? Do you think it's uh, a good idea? Or it's uh, an old stake? It's too late? It's not enough? It goes into the right direction or, it's on, or the wrong direction? What is your point of view uh, from this GDPR uh, implementation in Europe? So as a hacker, I'm not an expert on regulations. This is why I have a sister who is a lawyer and an expert on cybersecurity regulations. And she has told me that these types of regulations are actually creating a lot of positive impact around the world, not just in Europe, in California, in Oregon, and other US states. There are rules on privacy and protection of consumer privacy. What I think is the main impact from GDPR in Europe is actually the creation of a new job a DPO, a data privacy officer, or a data protection officer, which is a new kind of job, a new kind of specialty in many organizations to become a privacy expert. And these are typically not technologists, but rather lawyers or even accountants and auditors. So that's something I see as a positive development, the rise of a new type of position, an expert on privacy and how to keep the organization compliant with the GDPR regulation. So on that front, I think creating some positive developments and some positive impact. But I'm for government regulation to help me protect my data. Okay. Uh... Take ownership of your own data. Don't wait for anybody else to protect it for you. Okay, there was a little uh, lag on your connection. Uh... One other question, uh, because just a few words, because um, uh, Larry Lessing uh, tomorrow, uh, Lawrence Lessing tomorrow will have uh, uh, will give us his point of view from a, a lawyer perspective concerning GDPR and uh, the democracy, generally speaking. Uh, so stay tuned and watch the the talk from Larry uh, tomorrow. Um, Another question uh, concerning pseudonymity. Uh, pseudonymity is used uh, to be used to be a hallmark of the internet culture. Indeed, these days, corporation and government entities seek to find a robust way to identify people on the web. Do you think this is a reassuring trend, or rather a, worry, a worrisome uh, one? So 
if the question is about identifying people on the web, I think that we're going to see the rise of more technologies that are going to uh, pinpoint identities. Like I mentioned, identity is going to become the next boundary in the evolution of intellectual property. For a certain perspective, this is positive for us. So for example, in the banking world, in the financial world, you don't know this, but actually many banks already use continuous behavioral biometrics. So they're already tracking your activity online, making sure that you are indeed the person behind the screen and not somebody that has your password. Uh, with other types of financial tools like Bitcoin, for example, I think the pseudo anonymity, as you mentioned, is becoming a next uh, barrier for some government agencies, but it's being so widely adopted I don't think it's going to go away. So we're going to see more digital currencies with different different ways, different variations on how anonymous they are indeed. In the past week, we've all learned that actually the American authorities were able to take back some of the Bitcoin that was paid as a ransom in a major ransomware case that just took place last month in the US. So the American authorities are, have demonstrated they have some ability to track transactions via the blockchain and via Bitcoin. And hopefully uh, this will lead to the development of other types of cryptocurrencies that maybe offer different levels of anonymity. I'm following this de the development of these very closely as I'm personally fascinated by the rise of cryptocurrencies. Okay, we still have 15 minutes together, uh, Karen. And a question that uh, could be asked also to Rafa Fouch, uh, who will speak uh, later on today. Don't you think that we have to protect our data against Facebook and Google themselves and not only from hackers? Is there a way that someday we will have a public, kind of public Google Facebook, protected by democratic governments, otherwise another economic model of social network uh, that we pay. What is your point of view on this? So we can eventually compare the, the way uh, Rafa Fouch answered this question. I think there are already some alternative social media networks out there. For example, one I've learned of is called counter social. And counter socials claim, claim to be very protective of your privacy. And I think it's interesting that uh, any entrepreneur can suggest an alternative to something like Facebook. Google, perhaps, is a little bit more difficult to replace because we've all seen that, you know, if you do an experiment, some people have done this, do an experiment, try and live your life without using any Google products for a few days, you'll find your life to be a lot, a lot harder. So that's an area where I don't see a lot of alternatives, where I do, also, I do see alternatives to social media platforms. And yes, I think it's about time that we take, take responsibility of the information that we share and the way we interact with these platforms. Personally, I can tell you that I have limited my interaction with platforms such as Facebook recently, and that's a personal choice, of course, and anybody can do what they, what they wish. But uh, it's time to understand that these social networks have become, in some cases, larger than the contribution that they, they provide to us. They take away from us more than they give back to us, in some cases. Mm the ratio and the benefits and uh, are not very uh, in favor of the users sometimes. I got uh, a couple of questions of my own side, if you don't mind, Karen. Of uh, course. You've certainly witnessed an evolution of the, the security hackers community. Uh, and I was wondering if we could say that there is a trend in which we see that more and more security hacking coming from groups supported if it's not created by governments. I think in the early days uh, it was not so clear, but today I'm, I was wondering if there is a clear trend and is there a clear or so split between governance hackers and uh, uh, let's say citizen hackers, and do they mix uh, each other? Do they talk to each other? How do you see the, the evolution of the different communities? Because you're certainly the right person to ask this question. So I've definitely seen the changes in the global hacker community. When I was getting started, it was mostly individual hackers, citizen hackers, like you call them. And of course, there were some hacktivists group like the anonymous group, you can see the mask right behind me. And anonymous, I think, is the moment 
around the time that Anonymous was so popular is the time we saw the change, where suddenly a lot of government agencies realized there is a lot of potential to this thing called hackers. And if we create our own hacker groups, we can actually follow the geopolitics and create leverage in the world, hiding behind a face, hiding behind a mask like Anonymous, being uh, using it as a tool to hack into organizations, to put out announcements, et cetera. So I think we saw this change happen about 10 years ago. That's the point in time. I think if they write the history books of when hacking and cybersecurity became something that government agencies do a lot, it's probably around 2010, 2011. That's when it really became a strategic tool for several governments. And it shouldn't surprise us because as a strategic tool for a politician, it could be more useful than sanctions, military action, diplomatic conversations. If you can send out a hacker group to get into your target and, and, and act change that way, and then you can also disavow it because you can claim, oh, it's just a group of hackers. It's not something that my government has done. This is a very useful tool for a politician. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we're going to see more and more of that. And. Uh... We talk about two different groups, let's say the hackers from the government and the hackers from the citizen. Uh, will you see the emergence of a third that could be the corporations, hackers? Because when you mentioned Google or Facebook, they might have the power and the willingness to organize a kind of uh, security hacking activities group. Uh, is it uh, just science fiction or could it be possible? Not science fiction. At the moment, many of the major technology companies have their internal hacking teams. However, these teams are focused on protecting their infrastructure. But they do that. They protect the infrastructure using the same hacker tools and the same hacker mindset that an attacker would bring. So this is part of how Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon, any huge technology company that you can think of, Netflix, Uber, all of these companies have positions within the company for offensive security researchers. They're just like hackers, only the attack, the technology, the infrastructure, in order to make it better, to make it stronger. And this is, again, something that's only growing. More and more companies are learning that they have to bring in the hacker mindset if they want to be prepared for the challenges of the future. So they are hiring more and more hackers to work as hackers for the corporate. Whether we'll see these uh, corporate hacking teams attacking other organizations, I don't think it's completely science fiction. It really depends on the ideology and the values of the company and maybe the type of um, country, the type of government that is behind that kind of um, corporate. But uh, it's definitely something that in science fiction books has been explored. So in the cyberpunk books that I grew up on, there are malicious hacking teams that work for a variety of corporations. So we can definitely see that happen in the future. Thank you. Another question which is related to not only hacking but also spying. Uh, the question is the following. Do you think we have to protect our data from democratic governments, like the famous Cloud Act that allows US government to access almost all private data, not mentioning the fact that they spy through the data wires directly, so it's not just a hack, it's just from go direct to the data wires. Uh, how would you answer this question, Karen? I'm going to say something that's maybe not popular, but I believe it's true. It's going to be very hard for somebody to hide something from the US government because of the way the internet is set up and because of the fact that most of the major technology companies, most of the major cloud companies are based in the US. That actually provides the American authorities with incredible access to information, whether it's via wiretapping or with warrants they have they can legally request access to information from a lot of these technology providers so are we going to manage ourselves in the future thinking where does this application come from are we going to only install applications or run a software that comes from europe for example i don't think that we're going to see that kind of segregation in order to protect ourselves that said if the American government is after you, it's very, very hard to hide. 
it's very ha- very hard to hi- hide from them. And cyber criminals have discovered this. In the past few weeks, the FBI has announced that the FBI actually created an encrypted application that they marketed to criminals. And a lot of criminals around the world were using this so-called encrypted application that the FBI was actually behind. Yeah. Now, this is something that they announced. What else are they doing that they're not announcing? Yes, effectively, <laughs> we've seen this on the news recently in yeah. Australia. Um, another question regarding cryptocurrencies. Uh, I'm reading the question. In my own echo chamber, there is a consensus that cryptocurrencies and the lack of regulation about them are the primary factor enabling the current ransomware epidemic, or rather a pandemic. Uh, what is your opinion on the matter? I have heard it said that cryptocurrencies have been the killer app for ransomware, or maybe it's the other way around, that ransomware is the killer app for for cryptocurrencies. I don't agree. So I think ransomware has been around since way before cryptocurrencies were popular. There are other ways for criminals to exact transactions. And in fact, as we just saw the past two weeks, the American authorities were able to use the blockchain transaction to track down the money and to actually seize some of the Bitcoin that was paid. So it's not necessarily going to stay as the best way for criminals to extract payment. And I, I want to remind everybody that criminals still love cash money, right? You still see a lot of criminal transactions around the world that take place in paper money, which is a lot less traceable than cryptocurrency. So I do think uh, that I understand why a lot of people are making the connection between Bitcoin and ransomware. And certainly it has led to the popularity of Bitcoin. I believe a lot of companies are buying Bitcoin because they want to have some cryptocurrency in case they have to pay a criminal. But that doesn't mean that cryptocurrencies have to be forever doomed or related just to criminal activities. I think they do have a future beyond criminal activities. Strange, strange way to consider cryptocurrencies, saying that corporations are having cryptocurrencies to pay ransomware. (laughs) I think that's one of the reasons that the cost of some coins have gone up. You know, if you look at coins like Bitcoin, but also if you look at coins like Monero, So Monero, the sign of it is XMR, if I'm not uh, mistaken. That's a currency not a lot of people heard of. And then some ransom payments were required in Monero. So some companies started buying more Monero and slowly it it became more valuable over time because there was some more demand for it. Mm. So for a specific cryptocurrency, perhaps the question is correct that for a specific cryptocurrency, ransomware makes it more popular, makes it more acceptable. But generally, I think cryptocurrencies have a much greater potential, and they're not just for criminal activities. Okay, a practical question. Uh, protecting ourselves, yes, but what about our relationships, connections, which do uh, not have the same level of protection? Do you have any tips of best practice to overcome this shortage? Fantastic question. So in the same way that you have to take responsibility for your own digital republic, in a way, I would like to recommend that you try and become the chief security officer or the friendly hacker for your friends and your family. Tell them about signing up for multi-factor authentication or two-step verification. Tell them about not recycling their password. Encourage them to have the basic cyber hygiene. Just like in the past year, we've all learned to not just maintain our social distance, but to ask somebody to put on their mask and to make sure that our friends and families got vaccinated for their benefit and for everybody else's benefit. Cybersecurity in the same way requires all of us to look out for one another and ask people, ask your friends, ask your families, hey, are you using the most up-to-date device, your phone, your computer? When's the last time that you refreshed your passwords? Don't share your passwords. You can become a champion for more security for everybody around you. In the same way that in the past year, we've all learned to care for one another. We've got an opportunity to build on the lessons of COVID-19 and to introduce the same concepts of caring for one another in the cyberspace as well. 
So spread the word, watch Kiran uh conference, uh, read his book, her book. Uh, inspired by our question, what does technology want? Uh, I have a question for you. What does security hackers want? I mean, ex 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 except money. Uh, are some of them uh, hacking for climate change, for example? Uh, is there a connection between uh, Greta Thunberg and the, com the hackers' communities? Uh, do you see things uh, emerging concerning the motivations of the hackers' communities? So I think that the motivation for a lot of hackers is curiosity. Certainly for me, it's about curiosity, is what can I do? How far can I get? How can I access information? But specifically to your question, yes, I do think that there are some groups out there that will try to use hacking capabilities in context with other ideologies, like global warming and climate change, or maybe even vegetarianism. So the past week, there was a ma or two weeks ago, there was a major ransomware attack on one of the world's largest manufacturers and producers of meat, a Brazilian company called JBS. And it, it's interesting to question whether the attackers just went after that target because they believed that they could get a lot of payment from them, or maybe they think that the mass production of meat in factories and, and in such an industrial scale is something that goes against their ideology. In the past, we also saw an attack on an aluminum factory, Norsk Hydro. It's actually a major aluminum provider, one of the biggest in the world. And one analyst has estimated that the attack was actually a counter to the environmental practices of that company that was allegedly polluting rivers in Brazil. So I don't know if that's true or not. I can tell you that there are some um, analysis to that point. Some people are bringing it up as a hypothesis. I don't have any proof to back it up, but I do think it's interesting to say that some hacktivist groups still have other ideologies and it's not just about money. Okay. Thank you very much, Karen. We are going to close this uh, session. It was a real pleasure to have you, your kindness, your professionalism, all the clear and important information that you gave us and the analysis. It was a real pleasure to have you. Thank you very much. Have a nice day in Tel Aviv and hope to see you sooner in Paris for all the audience here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karen. Bye. Merci, merci uh, à tout le monde. And everybody is welcome to come to Tel Aviv. Life is back on track here in Tel Aviv. If you want to come by July 22, we are hosting B-Sides Tel Aviv, Israel's largest friendly hacker community conference. It's free, it's international, it's here in Tel Aviv. You're welcome to join me here in the sun. Wishing everybody the best. Thank you so Thank much you. for having and me. It's in next month. Thank you very much, Karen. And we go back right now.